Chris, are you there? Hello. Hello. Sounds like everyone's here. Oh, fantastic. Gentlemen. All right. Everybody sound good to everybody else? Sure, except for you. Hello. We have to listen to you. <clears throat> All right, well, I'm going to let that go, and we're going to get started. <laughs> this is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1698, Previews! I'm Brian Chrisman. I'm Adam Murdo. I'm Brian Deemer. And I'm Chris Everly. And welcome to the show. Time to go through the previews catalog. This is the May 2018 previews for items. Shipping to stores mostly beginning in July. And we have not one but two people on the horn with us right now. Mr. Brian Deemer and Chris Everly. Hello. <laughs> uh, I want to see how glorious it is to have the founder with us. Honored, sir. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Whatever, you know. <laughs> He's gone slumming, apparently. <laughs> well, before we get into the catalog, as always, our sponsor comes first, and this episode is brought to you by Discounts Comic Book Service, DCBService.com. We go to for all of your pre-ordering needs, because right away, when you pre-order with them any DC, Marvel, Dark Horse, or Image title, they are right away 40% off cover price. Most other <laughs> yes, most other publishers between twenty and thirty-five percent off cover price, and they do run many specials. We're up to forty-five, fifty, sixty, even seventy-five percent off cover price. Of course, they'll have bundles of like uh, titles together for one low price. Um, they have the continuation of the DC Marvel. Trade a hardcover. When you put it from any new one of those, they are half off cover price right away. And, of course, they offer bags and boards. You can get your book shipped to you weekly, uh, twice monthly or monthly. They're fantastic. We've used them for quite some time. So please check them out if you haven't already done so at Discount Comic Book Service, DCBService.com. Well, I think I've probably been a customer of theirs for like 15 years yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Quite some time. That's crazy. Yep. And I want to point out that I've been a recent customer of theirs since uh, last year, and I'm thoroughly happy with their service. In fact, I forgot the previews last month, and they're going to send it to me, which I appreciate. Oh, nice. Nope. Awesome. Awesome. Second to none customer service from DCB Service. Indeed. Hey, guys, can I throw a curveball here and ask, because I can't be here the whole time, can I ask to start with DC? Oh my goodness! Of course, cats. Oh my God! It's what's heard of. What's going on here? <laughs> well, you'll find out. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, let's go to the issue number one of DC Preview, which is its own little catalog yes. into the um, thing here. The great previews reconfiguration continues. And I have to point out, gentlemen, that this is the last time where I forgot the previews. So I went to my local comic shop to get it. And the retailer forgot to give me the new DC preview, so I'll just kind of riff on what you guys say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. All right, well, Fire so the, the cover, of course, starts out with The Wedding of the Century, Batman and Catwoman, number 50, Batman, by, written by Tom King. Yep, and that's... Hey, uh, this is a, a good little anecdote. So I was at the comic book shop on Saturday, right, for free comic book day. Yeah. <clears throat> and I overheard... One of the guys who works there talking to a customer saying, talking about some, some cool books, and he was saying, you know, Scott Snyder, Batman, he's like, that was that was a really good run. Scott was like super hot writer until Tom King came along, and now he's the hottest writer in comics. And I was like, oh, look at that. <laughs> Actually, I want... Let me piggyback on that because I'm very late to the party. I'm now I'm reading Tom King's run now on Batman in trade, and right I'm reading volume four, The War of Jokes and Riddles. And I got to tell you, this is a classic Batman run. I, I am just devouring it. He is without a question. I've said this before, but I don't mind repeating myself ad nauseum. He's one of the best writers in comics. 
I enjoyed Snyder's run, but I don't think it holds a candle to this. This this is this is some of the best Batman I've read in years. Have you got now, Chris? Have you gotten to the CGS cameos yet in that story arc? No, I have not, Pansy. Okay, thank you for reminding me about that, though. But no, I have not. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that ships on July fourth, uh, along with Catwoman number one, ongoing by uh, Joel Jones, same day. Now, don't read that one first. Read the Batman fifty first, then <laughs> Catwoman number one. Otherwise, you could be thoroughly confused. Well, she's holding Batman 50 in her hand on the cover to Catwoman 1. Exactly. <laughs> so if you turn to page 4 here, this is what I want to talk about. Okay. Um, it's uh, for, for Chris, it's uh, Superman number 1 and Action Comics number 1001. Um, they're the first books at DC written by Bendis. And as uh, Bendis is definitely my favorite writer in comics, I am... Very curious about what he's going to do. I might pick them both up for a couple issues and see see what I think. Um, it's interesting because my my immediate gut reaction was, "Oh, why Superman?" Because he's he can be such a boring character. He can be really really cool. There's like eight stories that have ever been told where he's really really awesome, and the rest <laughs> is kind of boring, right? You know. And so I was like, "Oh, why isn't it almost any other character in the DC universe?" I would have been more enthusiastic but then i thought well is this a chance to be the ninth best you know awesome uh superman story ever told so i'm gonna give it a shot because i love them and uh and we'll see see how it goes did you uh pre-order the man of steel miniseries no okay that's bennis's <laughs> really first oh, other than the action comics 1000 and i guess a dc special um number zero his real first um superman story oh i didn't know that i missed that. I, didn't, I didn't even notice it in the in the previous previews i'm because i sort of skimmed dc so i believe you would okay <laughs> well, well it, i'll have it's to quickly. go to the store and there, check them out there you go cool well i'm back going to read a dc comic for the first time in like seven years or i don't know <laughs> what else gentlemen what do you want to talk about here I'm, 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 i have the checklist in front of me so i can kind of riff based on what you guys talk about well, I see on page 26 that uh, Future Quest Presents is uh, coming to an end, uh, you know, the uh, anthology that uh, followed the uh, Future Quest 12-issue uh, maxi series featuring uh, classic Hanna-Barbera action characters. Um, it's now coming to an end with its 12th issue, as did Future Quest before it. And uh, the man who started it all, writer Jeff Parker, is there at the end as well, art by Marseille. Uh, it's a story of uh, Buzz and Frankenstein Jr. Close things down. Um, is everybody reading, or are, are some of you reading Mr. Miracle? Uh, yes, I'm maybe an issue or two behind. Okay. Adam? Um, I'm ten issues behind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Deemer, have you given that a shot? No. Okay. Uh, I, I thought you might, I, I was wondering if you had it read or not. I wanted to recommend it to you, and I, I rave about it every previews because I just read the latest issue. Um, it, it, <laughs> It, it, it's – wow. It's like a paragon of what comics should be. It's taking a character that's, you know, a hallowed character but not like, you know, like the, a top-tier character, so to speak, and just making up a top-tier character just through innovative storytelling, uh, spectacular artwork, a deep love of, of, of the, the new gods mythology is coming out of it. Again, one of the great things about Tom King you see it in Batman as well is that he so respects the history of the character. Same thing when he did that classic Vision miniseries. And just, again, the mark of just a writer just at, at the top of his form. So check out Mr. Miracle. Well, I might have to check that out. Actually, um, God, when – I don't know what years it was, maybe like early, the early 2000s when um, – I don't know. It was in Justice League or whatever that – those stories, I don't know, that I really got into um, that character – it was really my first exposure to them. I guess it was, was it maybe just, it might have been in the late 90s, but I went and I read them in the early 2000s with the, all that um, uh, Jeff Johns stuff and whatever was before him or whatever. Um, but those are some great books, and I really like that character a lot. I think you're going to really dig this series. What else, cool. Well, I want to jump all the way ahead to page 63. The Crisis on Infinite Earths Companion Deluxe ah, yes. Edition hardcover. So my question for our staff crisis 
pathologist, Mr. Murdo. <laughs> um, this, they are saying here, all the tales that tied into Christ's infinite earth are collected at last. Now, that does not include all of the Crisis crossover bannered comics, obviously, and some that are not bannered so, which I think I've been debated should be included, are not. What are your thoughts on the comics listed here in the collection? You say there are some bannered crossovers that are not included, obviously. Well, um, All-Star Squadron, uh, from issues 50 to 56, mm. are clearly all uh, crisis crossovers. Mm, true, although a couple ba- of bannered. those are just uh, what they like to call Red Sky. I understand Diana. that. That's why I was asking what your thoughts are, because they say that that uh, tied into the uh, tale, because um, they're well, not all listed here. Well, then uh, the copy does not speak fair. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. All right. That's all that needs to be said. All right. Not, wouldn't be the first time. All right. Because uh, that doesn't include all the uh, monitor cameos from the year leading up to Crisis, for that matter. True, true. But, uh, I mean, 512 pages is, is still pretty hefty. But I, I was kind of curious that they don't include Wonder Woman 329. Mm-hmm, which was the final issue of, yeah. that, of that series. That, that caught my eye. Uh, several Green Lantern issues are, aren't here. Uh, DC Comics Presents 86 with Supergirl Plus. Well, there's some post-crisis yeah, things in there, but the but GL issues are pretty important. It was a uh, Guy Gardner finally being inducted into the core, leading his <laughs> raid on the moon of Quard in the antimatter universe. That's what I thought. Okay, so um, forewarned is forearmed. So you know, <laughs> caveat emptor. That too. I have a question: Is the elusive <laughs> loser special included? Yes, it is. Ah, okay. Actually, gentlemen, because in, in a way this works now for our, our discussion here because I have to ask this question because I only have the checklist in front of me. What is the DC Beach Blanket Bad Guy Special number one? It's like uh, on page four here or something. Yeah, page three. Uh, uh, it's page uh, three. 80 pages, nine ninety nine cover price. Um, it's uh, summertime fun featuring heroes and villains, mostly villains. Uh, it's pretty similar to something Robot Chicken on Adult Swim did a couple of years ago actually. So <laughs> – um, but yeah, the cover appears to be by Amanda Connor. It's got Giganta in a bikini sitting there drinking. I don't know. She's using <laughs> like a, a case of sunblock on her arm. Um, it's got uh, content uh, produced by Paul Dini, Lee Bermejo, Gabe Hardman, and Corinna Bechko, Tim Seeley, Shay Fontana. Uh, art also by Gabriel Hardman, David Williams, and more. And it's it's just basically it's a summer fun special uh, if set in the DC uh-huh. universe. It includes a story. Uh, uh, that uh, features a Joker and Bizarro team up, which is the main reason why I'm even considering buying this one at uh, ten dollars. Although, if you order it from DCBService.com, it's guaranteed to be forty percent off. <laughs> Way to go with the salesmanship, Murd. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey. He's a master. Sell, sell, sell. I'm looking at some of the trades here. Exit stage left. The Snagglepuss Chronicles. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> From uh, Mark Russell, the writer of that uh, Flintstones maxi series that uh, received so much acclaim. So this is his uh, Truman Capote esque take on that classic Hanna Barbera character. <laughs> Snagglepuss reimagined as a gay playwright. Fantastic. Uh, down at the bottom, looking at One Woman Diana Prince Omnibus. Is that the classic uh, Mike Sikowski era where she's she's not in she's in the mod outfit? <laughs> that is correct. That's on page eighty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's that's cool stuff. Yeah, DC's always doing well with trades. They, they always go back to the history, which I always like to see. There's a super expensive Sandman Overture edition, 150 bucks. Yeah, my, my library is so much bursting now that I, I, I just can't uh, dedicate my dwindling resource – not dwindling, but my limited resources to some of these things now. Say la vie. Yeah, I can buy miniatures with that money, man. Come on. Ha <laughs> ha! I could go back to Japan and buy more Gundam models. Woo! Uh, I look forward to discussing your trip uh, when, when I see you, my friend. Oh, I can't. It was amazing. I have no doubt. Every, I, I tell you what, I, 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 if I can tell a quick story here, is, um, it is comic-related. You know, manga, obviously, in Japan is, is everywhere. I mean, I saw so many people reading it on the train, both paper and uh, digital on their phones. I saw lots and lots of people reading manga on their phones. They even had manga on the airplane over there and the way back where you could, like, tap the screen and advance the page. Like, my, my kid read some, two volumes on the airplane. Um, but 
when you see all those comics, I was like in a friend. I wanted to go in, and even though I can't read Japanese, I wanted to buy all the manga. I bought like four volumes with the intention of learning Japanese just so I can read them because it was so motivating and so regenerative for my interest in comics. Um, because it was it was it was really cool to see a whole country yep. who was just in love with comic books, right? Um, and and there, you know, every Seven Eleven and every uh, other convenience store, there was a whole section of manga in the front, and it was just awesome. So it it it, it got my juices flowing again for comics. Well, I knew you would appreciate that, and knowing you, I'm sure you will eventually learn how to read those ma- those uh, manga books that you bought. Oh yeah, I already have a book on how to, how to you know learning Japanese. The kids and I are doing it together, and you know we'll we'll advance it with lessons and other stuff in the future once we surpass the book. So of, co- of course you will. I'm sure the lessons are efficiently structured, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to the day when you can converse in Japanese with my wife, and I'm sure yes, you do as well. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> And we'll leave that wolfish anecdote to another time. Terrific. <laughs> you guys didn't wait for DC. Do you want, oh, actually, they've changed the whole book. I just realized that as I go through it for the second time because I only mm-hmm. kind of skimmed through it before. But the order is different. So where do you guys, guys, you guys have more DC? Do you want to go to another company? Uh, page 35, uh, issues three and four of Scott Snyder's new run on Justice League, which uh, looks intriguing. Uh, you know, continuing some of the big things that he's been doing with the uh, – the uh, background radiation, the uh, cosmic structure of the DC universe. Uh, he's introducing the, a new type of lantern. Uh, John Stewart has an ultraviolet lantern. They've done all the colors of the spectrum, so there's something new, which is kind of interesting to me. Uh, page 52, uh, Dan Abnett's Titan series is undergoing a lineup change. Now they're bringing in uh, some different characters, Miss, Mar- uh, Miss Martian and the Natasha Irons version of Steel. Interested in that. Um, page 53, uh, just as uh, Scott Snyder's Justice League is uh, playing off some of the ideas he introduced in his Dark Knight's Metal miniseries, uh, Steve Orlando's The Unexpected series is going to be doing some of that as well. It's kind of a group of strange, offbeat characters who are learning that they have ties to the newly discovered Dark Multiverse. Uh, it's written by Steve Orlando, art by Carrie Nord, which is a good reason to check it out. And he's oh, amazing, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, under Trades and Heart Covers, uh, on page 58, you've got uh, the latest in a series of Batman Arkham uh, collected editions, um, each one focusing on a different member of Batman's rogues gallery and offering a selection of uh, different stories featuring that villain taken from across uh, the past decades. Um, there was a Hugo Strange one offered a couple of previews ago, and uh, for this uh, volume, uh, there's one featuring the Penguin. On the facing page, page 59, Astro City Broken Century, a hardcover collection of... Uh, well, focusing on what's been my favorite subplot of the, the latest volume of Astro City. It's written by Busick uh, with art by Brent Anderson, as most Astro City stories are. And it's talking about the broken man, a character who uh, is a personification of, like, the the power of music and the way it manif- – and its connection to counterculture and how it manifests itself in different time periods. He, he's been a whole bunch of different uh, costumed super people over the years. Every time a new uh, countercultural musical genre rears its head – the broken man is reborn, and uh, so it's sort of him reflecting on his life and uh, and uh, the, the things that he's learned and what uh, all of it means for the uh, the future of the Astro City universe. And we should point out uh, that Kurt Busiek, as the creator and, and owner of Astro City, is looking to the future, and, and the book will in the future be coming out only in trade paperback format. Mm. Yes, we have seen the end of Astro City as floppies, but yep. uh, this is a collection of some of the stories that Busiek told in that format. Indeed. And one more thing from me on page 75, uh, Legion of Superheroes, The Silver Age, Volume 1 in softcover, you know, just to, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Legion, which is going on this year in 2018. I'm glad DC's doing something. It'd be nice if they gave us an ongoing Legion comic that we could be reading, but uh, uh, they're, 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 they'll settle for uh, collecting uh, 328 pages worth of the earliest Legion stories from the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, I'm going to have to go soon, but... Uh... Like well, uh, do you have a lightning round? Anything you want to point out elsewhere in the book, Brian? Before you take off, Any, uh, anywhere. I mean, there's one. There's <laughs> one thing that I noticed, of course, in the Marvel previews. They have um, the teaser, right? That Fantastic Four is coming back yes. in August. So, and Dan Slott doing Fantastic Four. That, that's cool. And Sarah Pacelli. That, that's a good team. So, and there's six people on the cover. So it's the Fantastic Four six. I don't, you know, whatever. But that's cool. I mean, it's been too long since we haven't had a Fantastic Four comic, so I'm psyched for that. Well, I would recommend, uh, Brian, 
check out Marvel 2-in-1 by Chip Zdarsky. If you missed the Fantastic Four, that book is the next best thing because he just nails the, the, the dynamic between the thing and the human torch, and you'll, you'll love it. Okay, uh, cool. So, and I'm sure it's going to lead into this series. And I echo your sentiments. This creative team is tremendous. Looks like they have Reed and Sue with their kids, of course, uh, Johnny and, and Ben. So, this is long overdue. Uh, absolutely. Also, uh, in in this Marvel um, is the number one of the second volume of um, Ed Piscor's X Men Grand Design. I mean, if you can only read one comic, uh, you know, you, you should just go buy this book and just be like, okay, that was fantastic. Uh, Ed should get an Eisner for this. If he doesn't, it, they're completely rigged. So, yeah, th- that's a perfect that kind of bravado and 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 oh god, I missed you, man! Fantastic. <laughs> I I need you some more Deemer. Just tremendous. <laughs> ah, nothing like righteous vitriol from you. Tremendous. What else, sir? I don't know. I was at the comic store. Uh, <laughs> I actually ran yesterday, and I got um. So it's going to be in the in the um, preview in the um, image section. But I read issue number one of Isola. That's a really good book. What's the premise of that? So it's some you know alternate planet or some sort of like fantasy ish scenario. And there's this woman who's like a soldier guard, and she's protecting this tiger who, in like page two or whatever, you find out is actually the queen, but she got turned into a tiger. So. She, and, and you don't really know what's going on. It's a, it's a mystery, but there's, you know, all kinds of stuff happening. Artwork is beautiful. And, the, I mean, they actually did, went to second printing on issue one because it sold out. Um, and issue two just came out on Wednesday, yesterday. So um, you should be able to find it at your comic shop. It's really good. Oh, thanks for the tip, my friend. Anything else and you want to add to your listening round? Yeah, real quick. Um, Pants, did you buy the new um, Brian K. Vaughn book, Barrier? Um, I picked up the free comic book day edition, and I did order all five of the um, issues up for that series. So, have you seen the actual comic, not the free comic book day version? I have not, because that will come to my next DCBS shipment. It's like an inch taller than a regular comic. It's the same width, but just taller. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so you can't put it in any bag or board. It's pretty wild. <laughs> and it reads horizontal, right? Mm-hmm. Just like the free comic book day version does. Right, so. right. I can't cool. wait for that. I ordered those. They'll be coming my next shipment. I'm so excited for that. All right, guys. I Unfortunately, I have to run. Um, but thanks for uh, sharing some knowledge on the DC stuff. I didn't realize that those other Bendis books had been solicited, so I will go to the comic store this weekend and find whatever I can find. All right. Right on, cool. right on, right on. Hail Deemer. <laughs> thanks, guys. All right, man. Hail Keiko. Farewell, brother. Farewell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye-bye. 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 And then and so the suddenly my ears are a bit poorer. Oh. Oh, all right. And then all, now uh, on to the rest of Image, guys. You bet. Uh, I wanted to point out, um, you know, just jumping around, um, on page 47, very excited to see a new offering by the writer Sean Kelly McKeever, uh, Outpost Zero Number One. Uh, so listeners might know his name. He, he did the classic Waiting Place series. Which is one of the best representations of high school I've seen in any any media. In any media. And uh, I want to say he did um, he did some mystique some mystique stories for Marvel. I think he did this. Was it the Sentry book with, about that friendly uh, Sentinel, the kid? You guys know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yep. It was part of the uh, tsunami called, line, I think. Yeah, I think I think it was. I just think it was just called Sentinel, not Sentry. Excuse me. Right. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, He's an outstanding writer, so I'm thrilled to see uh, he's got a new book. I'll just read the, the, the copy. Welcome to Outpost Zero, the smallest town in the universe. The people there work the land, go to the fights every Friday night, and tuck their children into bed. But the outpost is no place for dreams or aspirations. To survive is ambitious enough. As Ali and her friends graduate to adult in a frozen world never meant to support human life, something stirs. Something sees. Now, what I love here is he's, he's no doubt tapping into his – uh, aptitude for telling stories about young people, but now he's putting it into a science fiction setting. So I'm totally going to get this. Very excited. If it's the same Sean McKeever I'm thinking of, he's also a very nice guy. We uh, we, we ran with him briefly uh, because uh, he uh, he and Norton co-created the Gravity character, and uh, so we actually shared oh, some table space right. with us. That's right. Okay, that's right, Murd. Well done. Creator well worth supporting. Indeed. What else, gentlemen? Ah, let's see, on page 42, Image is leading with a new series called Farmhand, brought to you by one half of the creative team from Chew. 
the recently concluded Chew. And uh, Farmhand is about a farmer who raises human body parts. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> hijinks ensue. Um, yeah, so it's kind of darkly humorous science fiction. And uh, the first issue is 50% off at DCBService.com. They have two offerings in here for I'm, – I'm sorry if I butchered the name. Uh, a less cot or coat. Uh, my apologies there. Um, Days of Hate Act won the trade paperback and The New World number one. He wrote – I think it was him. If I'm wrong, someone can work in the forums. He's writing James Bond The Body right now, which is one of the best James Bond comics um, that has come out since they – since. Um, uh, who the hell has a James Bond license? I just brain farted. Dynamite. Uh, Dynamite. Thank you, sir. And I'm deeply impressed with it. If this is a different writer, I apologize. But regardless, uh, the, 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 these two stories sound very interesting. Uh, the New World, and I've heard about Days of Hate. I haven't. I haven't read it. But this is the trade of issues one through six. The United States of America, 2022. The loss that ripped the two lovers apart drove one of the arms of the police state and other toward a guerrilla war against white supremacy. This is the story of what happens when they meet again. Sounds like a totalitarian Romeo and Juliet. I, I may have to check that out. What else for image, gentlemen? I think of most most of what I've got down here for image is just uh, issues of continuing series. So I think I'm I've said my piece for the image part of the book. Uh, well, like Murd said, I mean, image continues to. Uh, in fact, when Demer was talking about the manga experience in Japan. Uh, what I, I should have mentioned, I, I've just said this, but we talked about this before, is that when you when you go to Japan and you look at the – because we get some manga here. When you go there, you see the sheer breadth of what's available. I mean you, see, you saw it on trains and convenience stores. The manga stores themselves are, are, are just awe-inspiring in, in, in when you go into them. But every conceivable genre is addressed in Japanese comics, and I think Image, as best they can, carries that spirit here uh, in America because I just love how the, you know their, their titles just – Address so many different genres of storytelling. It's always refreshing to see that. So, but I, yeah, I, I'm again. I, I we've talked about these books before. Oh, I should point out one thing on page uh, eighty-eight. Thief of Thieves is returning. Mm. That's a book I've long uh, extolled. Uh, this current it, Robert Kirkman is like the, the creator of the concept, but he, other people have written the stories. Uh, great writers like Andy Diggle, for example. Um, this one's by Brett Lewis Art by Sean Martinbro, who, who is the artist of the whole series. And this is about like the ultimate thief and, and how he tries to get out of that life and how he's drawn back into it for various circumstances, both economic and personal and family related. Um, it's superb. I've loved every issue. I'm so pleased that they're, 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 they're coming back to it. So if you haven't tried that, try that. If you like, if you like, if you like a good heist story, definitely get the trades. There's six volumes out there. It, it's well worth it. Yes, thank you for pointing that out, Chris. Well, are you, do you read these, these Uh Well, I I read the first couple of arcs. Um, I don't know if I'm going to jump back on at this point, but I did enjoy what uh, what I did read. I think it was the Nick Spencer stories that I saw. Uh, yeah, those are yeah, yeah, Nick Spencer as well. All great. Yeah, nice to know it's Excellent. coming back to give us some closure. Um, Indeed. Since you've mentioned that, let me just jump back real quick to page 85 uh, to mention another series that's coming back uh, after a hiatus. Uh, seven, uh, seven to Eternity, the tenth issue, start of a new arc. Uh, this is written by Rick Remender, and it's kind of a high-octane, self-consciously cinematic uh, s- uh, space fantasy adventure. Oh. Art looks beautiful. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, uh, well, the cover is uh, – uh, well, one of them anyway is once again by Carrie Nord. Ah, oh, master. I'm sorry to see Dark Horse has been relegated to a secondary spot. I always like the fact that, you know, they they're right at the front of the book. Um, what, so you, you want to go on the Dark Horse? Or anything else you want to say about Image? Oh, I, I think we can proceed, Chris. All right, page ninety four. Right away, we have to acknowledge, for me, one of the best comics being produced today, which is the the World of Black Hammer by Jeff Lemire. Um, and this is this is the Quantum Age, so this is another offshoot story from the world of Black Hammer. Um, if, if 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 listeners, if, if you're a listener, if you listen to the show and you love superheroes, then the, the whole concept of the superhero. If you've not given Black Hammer a try, please do yourself a favor and get the first trade. It is such a, a loving yet dark sort of tribute to, to to the many of the concepts of the Golden Age and uh, and the Silver Age. It, it's I think it won an Eisner, I believe. Um, yes, it's, it's an Eisner award-winning series. It says right here. I don't want to spoil too much of, of the series. Just to, again, it's about 
a team of, of, of heroes who end up sort of exiled into this – we're not sure if it's a pocket dimension or what but, and, how, and how they're trying to escape and, and the history behind them, what happened to them and how they ended up where they were and, and sort of their, their interactions with each other. It, it's, it's brilliant. Um, I, I can't praise it enough. Yeah, much of what uh, Lemire has been doing in uh, the, uh, the Black Hammer and its various spin-offs and offshoots so far has been pretty closely analogous you know, or uh, in tribute to – uh, different uh, existing concepts from different comics universes. And uh, this new Quantum Age thing is uh, his love letter to the Legion of Superheroes. Um, and it includes a uh, flying, sentient, super-powerful armadillo. So even if I hadn't been reading Black Hammer to this point, I'd read it for that. <laughs> his name is Herb. Mer, that, that input is why you are a clutch, my friend. <laughs> I am here to help, my friend. You are here to lead, brother. I want to point out, um, page 98, I love the art of Dean Haspiel, and this is The Alcoholic. I've never read this. I've heard it's outstanding. Um, it's, it's a 10th anniversary expanded edition. It, it, the product copy it explores the life of a failing writer who's coming off a doomed romance and searching for hope. And now he gets, you know, finds in the, you know, inadvertently, not inadvertently, but unfortunately finds it in the bottom of a bottle. Um, so, a uh, big fan of Haspiel's art, so... I'm sure this is worth checking out. That's on page 98. Page 99, Anthony Bourdain. My wife and I are big fans of Anthony Bourdain's uh, travel shows. And, he, and here he has a new uh, hardcover. Looks like he's um, inspired by his uh, travels in Japan here. Inspired by the Japanese Edo period game. I'm going to butcher this. I'm sorry. Hayakumonogatari Kaidankai. I'm married to a Japanese woman. I'm ashamed. <laughs> or a hundred candles, a circle of chefs gathered to outscare each other with modern tales of fear and food from around the world and pray that they survive the night. Now, that could be interesting. What else, gentlemen, for Dark Horse? Uh, let's see. Uh, pages 96 and 97. Um, a miniseries called She Could Fly. It's the story of a 15-year-old girl who's become obsessed with a mysterious flying woman who appeared over the skies of Chicago and just as mysteriously and suddenly died in, in a ball of fire. Um, so it, it's kind of a, an off-kilter look at the concept of uh, superpowers and superheroism and also uh, an examination of the nature of mental illness um, and then how it's the, the two concepts kind of intersect. Um, so that looks like that looks interesting. It's a four issue miniseries, and the first issue is fifty percent off on DCBService dot com. Um, and then on page one hundred six, something I'm sure that uh, Brian Deemer would have uh, brought up if he'd had a little more time to spend with us: um, a collection of uh, comics featuring both well team ups between Stan Sakai's Usagi Yojimbo and uh, Eastman and Laird's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like every comic book ever published featuring those characters together is published in one volume. It is a uh, soft cover. It's uh, seventeen ninety nine cover price. I'm, I'm ashamed to say I've yet to read any Usagi Ojimbo. I'm sure I would love it, but I've yet to take that on. It says here it's full, full color, but uh, I assume that means those comics that were originally full color will be full color. The sample page is black and white. All right. Well, page 108. Uh, here's yeah, uh, the, the, a new original graphic novel from uh, Roger Langridge, uh, the man who brought us those uh, Muppet Show comics through Boom Studios a while ago and uh, also uh, did Snarked, um, which is a, a riff on the Walrus and the Carpenter and the Lewis Carroll characters. Um, this is uh, featuring original characters of his. It's called Criminy, and it's a story of a peaceful family of uh, anthropomorphic uh, puppy things that look kind of like the Warner Brothers and the Warner Sister from Animaniacs. Uh, they live peacefully on the uh, fantasy Isle of Burnswick. I'm guessing language is drawing on his own childhood in New Zealand for some of this. And uh, how they're... Uh, ousted from their home by invading pirates and uh, their, their madcap uh, trot around the globe trying to find you know, peace and safety for themselves. Um, it, it, Langridge has got a, a wonderful, whimsical sense of humor, and I love his uh, art style. You know, it, it harkens back to an, uh, an earlier time, to like classic uh, early Hollywood animation. Um, and it's in glorious full color, and it looks like a fun little story. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's Criminy Volume 1, and I think I may be giving it a try. I want to point on page 119, um, Conan Omnibus Volume 6, Savagery and Sorrow. This includes um, what I think is Brian Wood's masterful take on Conan. Uh, 
the uh, Song of Belit, uh, which, which is Conan by the Barbarian issues 19 through 25. Um, I'm a big fan of pretty much anything Wood writes, but his take on Conan, on, on the classic story of the Queen of the Black Coast, so enthralling. Uh, I mean, he, just, he explores that relationship in, in ways that you know they probably couldn't have done to the same degree back in the 70s and when, when they did those classic stories for Marvel. Uh, the, the, the violence, the sensuality, the, the, the dynamic between Conan and Belit, it, it's, it's, it's an enthralling uh, story and I highly recommend. If you don't want to buy the whole omnibus, because there's other fine stories in here as well by Fred Van Lente, for example. But just go back and get those individual trades. It's it's classic Conan. You guys want to go to Marvel? Uh, let's uh, slug it out here. Let's go to IDW next. Um, they have the trade out for the uh, Transformers versus the Visionaries miniseries. That's on page 136. It's uh, their attempt at uh, reviving um, my favorite uh, 80s Hasbro toy property, right. yeah. which is one of the lesser known ones, but one which I really loved when I was uh, in, in late childhood. Um, they brought it back in a pretty drastically altered form, though, and I didn't much care for it. Um, so should I decide to check it out? It's the, the Visionaries paired with the more popular Transformers, which I think was the right move for IDW to make. Um, but uh, that solo Visionaries comic that we were pop promised uh, months ago has not yet uh, materialized, so i got to wonder if maybe this miniseries didn't sell all that well. But if you were curious and didn't buy it the first time around, it's in trade now, right there on page 136. The robots in disguise meet the knights of the magical light. <laughs> but you didn't, you didn't care for the interpretation, you said, when you read some of the individual issues? Mm, yeah, not, not particularly. It's it, It's... Yeah, not, not especially recognizable. You know, it, 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 it's bears very little resemblance to the uh, animated series and comics and toy property that uh, existed back then in the, in the late eighties. I want to put on page one fifty. Uh, automatically exciting because the Tipton brothers are writing yet another Star Trek story, Star Trek: The Next Generation, Terra Incognito number one. Um, this is a new Next Generation series. This is also tied into the Mirror Universe. Um, they re- they don't realize that one of their crew members has been switched b- by the mirror counterpart, and apparently Lieutenant Barclay is from the Mirrorverse. So definitely checking that out, and one of the covers by the great J.K. Woodward. What else from IDW, gentlemen? Uh, well, all right. Um May as well mention here. On page 141, there's a new Big Hero 6 series coming out uh, from IDW. And uh, this is based uh, – well, this is the Disney uh, uh, feature film slash uh, new animated TV series uh, version of those characters, not the ones that appeared in the Marvel comics. Right. But, yeah, so if you enjoyed that film, now you'll have some comics to read based on the same takes on those characters. Yeah, I remember watching that movie with my boys. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Anything else from IDW? Again, a lot of you know they they got a lot of great uh, licensed properties here. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to. Oh, actually, sorry, Murray. Go ahead. I mean to cut you off. No, there. no, no, no. That's, I was just going to say that was all for me. So go ahead, Chris. Okay. Uh, this is very exciting for me. Page one sixty three. Uh, I remember hearing about this years ago. I never read it. Is Bram Stoker's Dracula, the, the Francis Ford Coppola film, which I'm a big fan of, with all its excesses um, <laughs> from the early nineties. Uh, written by Roy Thomas in immediately, but then the art by Mike Bignolia, and this is very early in his career. Um, I, I, I may pick this up if I, can, if I can swing it financially depending on my budget for the month, but this artwork is stunning. I'm just looking at the sample pages and the cover, and uh, I'm a huge fan of this film. Uh, again, it, it's got some over-the-top elements, but uh, Gary Oldman's performance as Dracula is spellbinding, and um, – Damn, i, I got to put this movie on later and watch it now. Uh, but I've always heard great things about this adaptation. So if you're a Magnolia fan, that might be something you want to pick up if you've never seen it before. Oh, for sure. Oh, pants, page 168. Artifact edition, Jim Lee, DC Legends. We've got a host of uh, original artwork from Jim Lee uh, scanned into this new uh, Artifact edition. $125. I will not be buying it, but <laughs> looks immensely fun. Yeah, they're actually daring to tell you how much it costs. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. All right, you guys ready for Marvel? Yes, sir. All right. 
Now, as uh, our glorious uh, founder mentioned, uh, the mini open the catalog, seeing Dan Slott, Sarah Pacelli, August 2018, Fantastic Four, in immediately. Uh, I've so missed these characters. Um, now, we know that Disney may be purchasing Fox, so I'm hopeful that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they will, as they get into the new phase of films, perhaps they could anchor those new films w- by introducing the Fantastic Four, kind of giving their place in a way as the, you know, like the originators of at least of a, another part of the, of the Marvel Universe on, in film. Um, again, that abomination that came out several years ago, if anything could have ever put, turned me to drink, it would have been that movie. <laughs> um, I always like to tell the story of we went to a theater in Pittsburgh with my dear friends Dan and Ryan, and the theater offered alcohol. Ryan kept getting up and getting beer. Like That was – even Michael B. Jordan couldn't save that movie. But um, I have no doubt Dan Slott and Sarah Pacelli are going to save this comic. So very excited for that. Uh, Captain America number one, gentlemen. Tan Hesey Coates writing. Lineal Francis Yu is the art. <sighs> That's enough. I mean I'm loving Coates' work on Black Panther. Can't wait to see how he interprets uh, Captain America. They give some sample artwork in, in there as well. What do you guys want to talk about in the Marvel book? Ooh. Mert? Well, let's see. Um, okay, new Spider-Man series uh, right in the wake of the, recent, the soon-to-be-recently concluded uh, Dan Slott volume. Um, first two issues. It's written by Nick Spencer this time. Back to basics, they say, although which basics they're going back to? Anybody's guess. They keep saying point. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Um, pages 10 and 11, we've got a uh, five-issue miniseries, uh, a little bit of revisionist history retelling the origin of uh, 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 Carol Danvers, uh, the, the life of Captain Marvel. You know, and, of course, there will be a movie featuring that character coming out uh, early next year. So this is sort of part of the lead-up to that. Uh, that's written by Margaret Stoll with art by the redoubtable Carlos Pacheco. Oh, I love Pacheco's work. I'm curious if in the film when we see Captain Marvel – if they're going to create a history where the original Marvel played a role in her story, I, w- I wonder if they're going to mention him at all in the movie. I'm just curious about that. I believe he is supposed to be a part of the cast. Oh, great. All right. Now, Murray, what do you think about Cosmic Ghost Rider number one on page 14? I've been hearing his name mentioned a lot. He's an important supporting character in the Donny Cates run on the Thanos book, which unfortunately you and I both uh, missed out on because we dropped it right after Lemire left. Apparently, Donny Cates uh, took that ball and ran with it in some interesting directions, among them introducing this Cosmic Ghost Rider. He'd, he'd been a herald of Galactus, and now he's like a second banana to Thanos. And underneath all that uh, armor plating in Cosmic Hellfire, apparently he's Frank Castle. <laughs> I don't know if he's a future what? Frank Castle okay. or an alternate universe Frank Castle or what, because uh, there's an ongoing Punisher series, which also has a Frank Castle in it. So how he happens to be able to be in two places in two such very different guises uh, simultaneously, I don't know. But apparently he's been a pretty popular character in that Thanos book because now he's got his own five-issue miniseries written by the same Donny Cates. Well, we can always get the trays to see what we're missing on that Thanos run. Again... I, I tend to move from book to book depending on the writers and also just, just budgetary reasons. But if something gets that much acclaim, I can always go back to the trade. I want to echo Mr. Deemer's comments on page 22 and 23. X-Men Grand Design by Ed – it's Ed Pisker, right, John? Uh, right, right, Murd? Uh, I'm not sure if it's Piscor or Pisker, but I, I, I lean towards Pisker. Uh, Mr. Weatherington can correct us as always if need be, Certainly which we can. appreciate. And sorry, Murd, I don't know why I almost called you my younger son's name for a moment. Um, <laughs> Just these kids are always your mom and your parent, I guess. But uh, this, this, the, the first two issues of this, where he talked about the Silver Age, I, I mean, I couldn't, agree, I couldn't echo cinemas more. They're Eisner worthy. I mean, just the way he takes the entire history of the X Men, pre- presents it to you in just, in just, a, just a new way. But it's all the history is there. It, I just devoured them, so I cannot wait to get this book. Outstanding. Uh, Murray, have you read any, read any of the Infinity Countdown yet? I have not. I have picked up the first few issues to be published, and uh, they've been much better than I expected them to be. The art has been exceptional, um, and uh, that there, there's a, more respect to the history of the Infinity Gems as a concept than, than I expected there to be. Most characters still call them stones, but a couple of them, like Warlock, the ones who've known them the longest, do still employ the term gem. 
So that, that, that's oh. enough to win this nitpicky fan over. Uh, but it's, it's a great cosmic story, um, beautiful artwork, and I, I, I let slip in uh, our Avengers Infinity War review, the one, one scene from the third issue, but, uh, a take on Drax that acknowledges that uh, the writer has done his homework on that character. So it's, there is oh. some respect being paid to history here, and uh, it, it's a great cosmic adventure to boot. Well, knowing my love of history, uh, and, and combined with your recommendation, I have the first couple issues of my knife, and I'll read them as soon as I can. Uh, page 28, I mean, Mike Diodato artwork here on Infinity Wars Prime, number one, uh, Jerry Duggan writing. I mean, this looks beautiful. Wow. So I'm, I'm probably going to check that out. Hmm. Hunt for Wolverine, Hunt for Wolverine, Hunt for Wolverine. Okay. Flip, flip, flip. Um, I actually have the first... I got the first and so on that I haven't read yet to give it a try. Uh, again, I, I can't wait to get – it should be my next shipment, Avengers number one by Jason Aaron and McGinnis. That's all I need there. Um, Pants, did you read Thor 706? Uh, no. Okay, I won't say – talk, we'll talk about it when you do. Uh, I'm looking forward to your reaction to that. So it's sort of you know Aaron wrapping up his arc before he moves on to the, the new volume of Thor, but I'll say no more. Uh, let's see. Again, Dan Slob returning to Iron Man on page – well, not returning, but he's starting the new Iron Man book on page 43. It's issue two. I'm sure that's going to be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Murder, are you getting the Quicksilver miniseries? I'm thinking about it. Uh, I've already forgotten to pre-order the second issue, but uh, the first issue is due out sometime this month. I'll have to give it a look. Uh, I've, I'm actually pretty impressed by Saladin Ahmed's uh, first few issues of uh, his Exile series. Uh, so I think I'd probably enjoy his take on Quicksilver um, and then the Scarlet Witch and their uh, fraternal relationship. Well, I've always been a Quicksilver fan. Um, there's no there's no page number here. Hold on. So pages 50 and 51. It's a the Marvel True Believer line where they where they give you cheap uh, reprints of some of their classic stories. Look at this page. Uh, my I'm I'm palpitating. These classic Fantastic <laughs> Four stories. Ah. Uh. I'm so glad the FF's coming back. Uh, that, that's that's a bit of home right there. Again, on page 52, Marvel 2 and 1. I cannot praise this book enough. It's so goddamn fun. And, and it, it, there's pathos. There's humor. I've so missed the FF. And, and Zdarsky just gets it. And this is, you know, I'm sure this book's going to be a great lead into the slot FF series. So, high, again, ongoing high praise for that book. What else for Marvel, Murd, that you want to shout out? Uh, well, the upcoming uh, Mark Wade. Mar- Marvel's doing a pretty good job of lining up some top flight creative teams for these relaunches of their uh, flagship characters. Mm. Um, I'm looking forward to the Doctor Strange book, uh, written by Mark oh, Wade, yeah. art by Jesus Saiz. And uh, here in the third issue, pages 60 and 61, Doctor Strange in space, he not only has to fight the Super Scroll, but one of the Infinity Gems, the incorrectly colored Time Gem, uh, is, <laughs> is involved. It's, it's the MacGuffin over which they're fighting. So that's that's exciting. We have Mark Wade writing the Sorcerer Supreme, and uh, the Infinity Gems are coming into play. That's some good stuff coming out for Marvel in the near future. Indeed. I'm going to jump ahead. You can, we can always jump back if you need to. But on page uh, – again, no page number. Hold on. I'm sorry. 82. Star Wars 50. Now, wow, it's already been 50 issues. Um, this Since Marvel got the rights back to Star Wars and they relaunched the flag title – Frankly, I have loved every single issue of this series. Jason Aaron wrote, wrote the bulk of it, and it seamlessly passed uh, into the hands of, of Kieran Gillen, Salvador La Roca providing breathtaking artwork. Uh, if, you're not, if you're a Star Wars fan you're not reading this comic, for Pete's sake, do yourself a favor and go back and get the trades of the back issues. It is tremendous. Uh, listen to this, this copy for the 50th issue. In this issue, hope dies. The rebel fleet is completed. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. It's secret. But no secret is kept for long from Darth Vader. The most epic story yet done in a Star Wars comic begins here. Prepare to witness the Empire truly strike back. Ugh, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get to see Gillen write Darth Vader once again. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, Mark, because his Darth Vader series, oh, I have the hardcover collection. I'm looking forward to rereading it this, this, over the summer. Uh, it was masterful. Darth Vader 18, Charles Soule did a wonderful job on that book as well. And this is a, a book of intrigue involving Vader and Grand Moff Tarkin. Oh, I can't wait to read that. And tying into that story on the facing page is uh, Annual Number 2 of Darth Vader. It was art by Leonard ah, yes. Kirk. Well done. 
Uh, I wanted to point out on page uh, – sorry, guys. Look for the page numbers. 93, Marvel Superior Adventures. Again, great to see them doing books for kids. Always like to see that. Um, there's a whole series of them here involving you know Spidey and Doctor Strange, Ant-Man, Black Widow, various characters. Even a, I guess, a kid-friendly version of Venom. I'm interested to see how they pull that off. Um, and, of course, on page 95, Marvel Super Adventures, Miss Marvel and the Teleporting Dog. Hey, it's Lockjaw. With a, with a Spidey's boot caught in his uh, maw there. Fantastic. Uh, trades. I wanted to put uh, pants. Oh, pantsy. I'm awake. <laughs> My pantaloons. My corduroy, page 101. Pants, I'm going to order this. I don't give a shit how much it costs. Silver Surfer by Slot and Allred. The whole blippin' thing. Omnibus hardcover. Oh. It's good stuff. But I have the issues. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I love this guy. Uh, uh, that's going on my bookshelf. That's one of, the, one of the great Marvel titles of the past several years. Ah, oh, Tremendous. I think I'm good with Marvel, unless you guys have something else you want to say there. Mer? I think I'm good to move on, Chris. All right, let's move on. All right. What are we next? I'm getting used to the new previews format here, so it is Dynamite. Okay. Oh, Mert, on page uh, 176, aren't you a fan of the Project Superhero stories? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the original Project Superpowers concept introduced by Alex Ross and uh, Jim Kruger. This has got to be... About a decade ago by now. Um, it was really enjoyable stuff. It was bringing together a bunch of classic uh, Golden Age characters from minor publishers that have now passed into the public domain. Um, Dynamite apparently was a fair success for them. They've tried doing a couple other things with uh, that the, the, the property. Uh, they brought in Warren Ellis to do a completely unrelated, darker take on it. There was something they did uh, that was uh, pretty much just a raunchy teen comedy, like a low satire uh, featuring teen superheroes. And now uh, we've got the team of Rob Williams and Sergio Davila bringing it uh, back to the original formula. I'm uh, going to be tr- playing it as more straight superheroics, uh, which is, I'm happy about. And um, Dynamite's offering this promotional zero issue on page 176 uh, for 10 cents. And if you order it through DCBService.com, that gets chopped down to 7 cents. I was telling <laughs> Pants before we got started here, I would pay all the way 300 cents for that. Because I am interested in these characters, and I want to see what uh, Rob Williams does with them. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm looking forward to more of uh, the, the classic formula of Project Superpowers, you know, tying in with the original continuity as established by Ross and Kruger. My friend, that was a magnificent uh, testimonial for that book. Bravo. I do Page 190. Go ahead, Mert. I'm sorry. I do think it's worth it, is all I was going to say. The, the Mert seal of approval is enough. Uh, page 190, uh, they're putting in paperback James Bond, the Eidolon tra- story, issues 7 and 12, the Warren Ellis series, or Jason Masters. This is – again, if you're a Bond fan, you've got to go to the Dynamite stuff. It's so well done. I've yet to be disappointed by any of the arcs they've done. Uh, James Bond, the body, which is coming out now, is, is one of some of the best James Bond I've ever read in comic book form. That might be in the running for my miniseries of the year, by the way. Um, so, again, check out those that trade. Great stuff. It's not, you know, I mean, I, I love the goofy versions of James Bond, but this is the, this is, you know, the, if James Bond were real and the brutality, the ruthlessness, the, you know, the, the, the compromised, you know, values that have to, and that have to be shaken, shook it off or shook, shook it off, um, uh, sloughed off for the job he has to do. It's tremendous. Anything else for Dynamite? Uh, one thing, on page 184, um, an original graphic novel uh, brought to us by writer Keith Champagne and artist Tom Nguyen. It's called The Switch, Electricia, and it's uh, kind of a Thunderbolts-style tale of uh, redemption. Uh, it's about a supervillainess named Electricia who starts to feel dissatisfied with her life of crime and uh, starts moonlighting as a superhero and uh, the ramifications and complications, some of them potentially deadly, that arrive in, arise in her life as a result of that decision. Uh, it's an interesting-sounding uh, premise. Um, and you know, Keith Champagne is a fair to Midland writer, and I really like the sample of art uh, by Tom Nguyen that we see here. Uh, and if only it were offered in soft cover for a little less money, I would probably give it a try. 
but as it is, it's uh, 96 pages, 20 bucks in hardcover. I'll wait until Dynamite uh, shovels it out again in a more affordable version, as I think there's a good chance they might. All right, may I uh, perambulate on to Boom? I'll perambulate away, Chris, and I'll peregrinate on behind you. (laughs) Page 206, if you're a Jim Henson fan, Beneath the Dark Crystal issues one of 12. Written by Adam Smith, illustrated beautifully by Alexandria Huntington. Um, So this further explores the the world of Dark Crystal. Artwork is gorgeous. Well, as I usually do with Boom's Dark Crystal stuff, I think I'll probably wait for the trade on this, but I will buy it eventually. But if you feel like buying the first issue now and uh, then the rest of the Maxi series and single issues, uh, the first issue is 50% off on DCBService.com. Page 208, Cullen Bunn, I think a very competent writer, has a new series, Bone Parish. A new, or- new drug assumed through the streets of New Orleans, one made from the ashes of the dead. War is being fought over who will control the supply while the demand only rises. While the crime families wage war, users begin to experience terrifying visions of the dead coming back to life through them. Interesting concept. Art looks good. Mm-hmm. Challenge these days is there's still so many great books coming out, but you got, you got a budget. Damn. <laughs> it's a skill I have yet to master, Chris, I'm afraid. <laughs> My, uh, uh, I want to point out – go ahead, Mert. I'm sorry. As my two mescent uh, DCBS uh, orders uh, attest to. Uh, excuse yeah. me? Two mescent. Swelling. Thank you. <laughs> I want to put on page 227 what a wonderful job Boom is doing with their Planet of the Apes archives. These are – we put the classic Marvel 70s stuff written by the, the great Doug Monk. Um, beautiful book covered by Bob Larkin on volume four. So like you know the black and white magazine stories. Uh, other material. I have the first volume. Gor- a gorgeous uh, production. Beautifully done. And if you're a Planet of the Apes fan, you will totally dig those stories. Believe me. As, as they said on the old uh, Kirby New Gods, don't think, just buy it. <laughs> uh, you guys ready for the rest of the book? Uh, one more thing. Page 229, uh, third issue of the f- current Fraggle Rock miniseries, uh, written and illustrated by Art Baltazar of uh, oh, Art wow, and Franco. Oh, I missed that. Well done, Mert. So it's uh, his take on the Fraggles, uh, minus Franco for this particular project. Well, on page 242, what else needs to be said? Strangers in Paradise number five. <laughs> you know, it, I, I, have, I just got issue three. I've not read it yet. Um, but issues one and two certainly did not disappoint. One of, the, one of the all-time great living masters of the comic book medium, Terry Moore, and of course returning to his most famous landmark uh, creation. So – if you've never read Strangers in Paradise, you owe it to yourself again to go back to those pocket editions or, or get the whole omnibus collect hardcover collection if you can swing it. As J- I mean, Jamie D. proselytized that book endlessly and deservedly so. For me, one of the great, one of those all-time great series. And on page two forty-three from Action Lab Entertainment, uh, Athena Voltaire number five starts a new story arc. Uh, with Steve Bryant, and to give us more information on that, we're going to talk now to Steve Bryant. All right, and now joining us to talk about his projects in the current Action Lab section of previews is Mr. Steve Bryant. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Hi, guys. All right, well, um, as we mentioned before, um, you are in the previews uh, for Action Lab for not just one, but actually two couple things. Why don't you discuss what you have there? Yeah, um, it's a it's a big month, so that's kind of cool. It's all about Steve uh, Bryant, Steve Bryant month at Action Lab. Steve Bryant, Bachelor <laughs> of Arts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, talk about setting the bar low for the company with <laughs> Steve Bryant month. Um, but uh, yeah, we uh, we're kicking off the uh, the second story arc on the ongoing Athena Voltaire uh, series. So it, it's it's really cool, um, as you guys know. Being able to do, uh, you know, a longer form story, you can, you can, you can layer more stuff. Um, you can, you can start building towards a, a bigger point instead of, you know, just kind of doing the the mini series. So that that's been a lot of fun. So yeah, we've got uh, the second story arc, the Golden Dawn starts, uh, and then we've got the second uh, Ghoul Scouts trade paperback coming out too. Uh, for, forgive my ignorance because uh, I sometimes do forget things that I've read. But ha- now, you're, you're of course, r- of the creator of Athena Voltaire character. 
long time yeah. ago with Speakeasy. We go all the way back to the early days of, of CGS. Um, like episode five or something. Wow, like now that. let's not be silly here. <laughs> okay. It's, it's early. I don't have to I'll look at my, my chart. But <laughs> you were the creative. You were also the artist for a long time. How long have you just been writing the character now and turning the art chores over to someone else? Uh, since we, we started the ongoing series. So um, quite recently then. Yeah, I, I uh, it was a combination of a couple of things. Um, Action Lab approached me with the idea of doing it as an ongoing, and uh, while I would have loved to have to have uh, written and drawn it, you know, I, I I finally figured out my limitations, and I'm also going. Uh, I, I went back to school a couple of years ago, so I just kind of looked at the schedule and said this would be great. I would love to tell a long form story, but uh, for you know the foreseeable future, I'm not the guy to draw it. Uh, you know, hopefully the book will have a, a pretty long run and I can kind of bank, uh, three or four issues and draw an upcoming arc. But, uh, the, uh, the first arc was by drawn by, uh, Israel, uh, Ishmael Canales. And the second one is drawn by, uh, Yusuf Idris and, uh, different styles from both guys, but they're, they're both terrific. Was it hard for you to let go of something you create and have somebody else draw it? Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, it, it took a lot, and and it was kind of a whole put your money where your mouth is kind of moment where um, I've never liked being micromanaged when I'm uh, trying to do someone else's work. So the last thing I wanted to do was micromanage you know, the artist on the book. So, um, I had to kind of divorce myself from the Steve artist hat and just kind of, kind of go with, uh, if this were one of my other books that I never drew, would I be happy with the work? Oh my God, I would be delighted with this. So <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Um, and the cool thing is, uh, both artists we've had on the book, um, stage things so differently than I do that I, it, it's kind of a learning experience for me to kind of, to view, you know, these scripts through the eyes of, of somebody that has uh, some different sensibilities. So I'm hoping I can, I can incorporate some of that when I come back. And of course we know you have a wonderful editor in Mr. Chris Murin. Oh yeah. Chris is, uh, just indispensable on this and, and ghoul scouts. Um, and we, we, Chris and I had mostly Chris had a, a personal <laughs> victory, uh, last November. Um, years ago, I mean, this thing has lingered for quite some time. Uh, I wanted back when the book was still at ape, I wanted to do a, uh, a prose collection of like, uh, you know, like old pulp short stories that were illustrated and get, you know, different writers to, uh, to write some Athena Voltaire. And, uh, I would do black and white illos and Chris, uh, like kind of contacted me through the forums and said, I would really love to edit this. And, uh, that was the first thing we worked on and it took years for the damn thing to come out. Uh, but that came out last November. Uh, and, yeah, Chris did a magnificent job shepherding that through. He's he's just become invaluable with uh, story development on Athena and on on Ghoul Scouts. Yeah, he's he's good people. We've known him for for he's been a long time CGS listener and just really good. He's one of the guys I miss talking to in person because I don't see him ever on many cons. He's usually only out in San Diego working with you at your booth. Yeah, yeah, and I mean we met on the the CGS forum, so. <laughs> You know, I, I I owe you guys a, a debt of gratitude for that. Well, that 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 just every time I hear that, and it happens a lot. You know, it really warms my heart to think of. I mean, we've been doing this, this show for thirteen years, and the things that have come out of the podcast, the forums, the friendships, the relationships between us and other people. It's just I I can't express how wonderful that makes me feel. It really does. No, it 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 was. Um like the first comics community that I got really heavily invested in, uh, as, as a creator. And, um, you know, I mean, 
I, I feel bad. I, I, ha- I haven't checked in on, uh, on the forums in years now just because the immediacy of being able to, to connect with people through Facebook and Twitter. Right. Is the, so, yeah, I, I feel bad about you know, stuff like that. But by the same token, you know, 13 years on, I still keep meeting people that discovered the book through CGS. And it's kind of funny if, if I'm like, oh, were you on the forums? They immediately say, yes, I was, you know, so-and-so. Oh, hey, I remember you. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it, that's a hell of a community you guys established. So it's pretty great. Uh, there's a DCBS exclusive for Athena Volta number five right now. You pre-order the standard cover what? and you receive a bonus Athena Voltaire trading card. And if you pre-order all three Athena Voltaire variants and receive three different trading cards and an Athena Voltaire exclusive print signed by series writer, creator, cover artist, Steve Bryant. That's correct. <laughs> That's a mouthful there. How about that? And again, DCBS are good people. We've known them forever. And another one of these things that warms my heart how we got to be with them. And it extends to our artist friends here. It's wonderful. Yeah, no complaints here. Um, yeah, so the 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 promotion is um, we have three, uh, three covers for this issue. Um, another friend of the show, Brent Schoonover, drew one of them. Uh, now, is that true because it says here in the catalog, it's also that it's shoon over with no C. I didn't type it. That, that's, <laughs> that's on Diamond. I thought that was or, Brent. I, or the publisher. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, Brent did one of the covers. And then uh, uh, Staz Johnson, who uh, uh, does Judge Dredd and has done some Batman stuff, did the other, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm pretty happy with mine. But good God, <laughs> looking at the covers those guys turned in, I'm just, I'm stunned. So yeah, they've they've given me the permission to um, do trading cards of of their covers too. So each cover you get a, a different trading card, and then uh, if you get all three, you also get a uh, a print from me. Nice. Very nice. Oh, and I got to also say, uh, and uh, uh, issue the uh, standard cover is 50% discounted DCBS, so it's like two bucks. And uh, the other two are like a 35% discount. That is correct, coming to 259 And they're also helping us out with uh, Google Scouts. Um, the, the second trade, I was a tween age werewolf, is 50% off also, so that's like $750. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get a free sticker with it. Yes. Um, we mentioned ghoul schools. Have we talked about ghoul school? I'm sorry, ghoul schools, ghoul scouts before in the show. Give us the, um, the, the the premise behind ghoul scouts. It is a big old love letter to movies like Monster Squad or uh, The Goonies. Um, and I, I thought of it back when my son was in uh, Cub Scouts. He's 17 now, so it took a long time to find the right artist uh, because, you know, the cartoony nature of, of what I wanted with it um, was not in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, about four years ago, I think, uh, I asked uh, Mark Stegbauer, who's a terrific inker, did a bunch of stuff for Marvel in the, uh, in the 90s. Um, but he's also a terrific cartoonist. So I asked him if he wanted to to draw it, and he just – it was lightning in a bottle. So that was great. Um, and, yeah, we've done two two trades of it now. Um, Athena Voltaire co- cover colorist Jason Millay is part of the team, as is the ubiquitous Chris Murren. <laughs> Now, uh, for the first uh, storyline, the Sorcerer's Pope, do you know when that will be collected in trade? Um, I think the trade for that comes out in June. Yeah, and Ghoul Scouts comes out in July. Yes. Excellent. Uh, Yes, so uh, Golden Dawn is a new storyline coming up in Athena Voltaire and, of course, Ghoul Scouts. Now, will you be at uh, San Diego Comic Con this year? Yes, 
Um, I'm going to be at San Diego. And uh, when does this episode air? It should air momentarily. <laughs> oh, cool. Seriously, I'm going to go then, put it together uh, and you'll go right up here. <laughs> next week, uh, I feel I feel like I'm I'm uh, I'm promoting a comedy club. Next week, I'll be at Yuck Yucks in Schenectady. <laughs> it's Schenectady. Thank you. Be good to your waitresses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll be at uh, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul Spring Con in oh. uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. At the last time I was there, actually, the one time I was there. That actually is within walking distance of Brent Schoonover's house, if I'm not mistaken. He could oh, with- I didn't know that. He never invites me over, probably because oh. <laughs> the publisher misspells his name. <laughs> uh. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like he walks to the con if it's in the same location as the last one that I was at. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so make sure you have him uh, uh, show you his home. I don't know what I'm going with this. There's a, there's a tiki bar somewhere oh my God. that I want to go to, so that's, <laughs> that's my passion. Oh. The tiki part, not the bar part. I don't really drink. Yeah. And now you're usually, I think, in small press at Comic Con. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so your booth number is like M14 in the past, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I got moved down to M13. Oh. But we got a whole block there with uh, Jim Heffern and Mike Heffern and myself, right. and then Chris is kind of the roaming. He's the roaming gnome. <laughs> uh, he, he's in all three booths. <laughs> Well, uh, anything else you want to mention um, to us, Steve, before we let you go? Um, I miss you guys and would love to do Super Show if it comes back. You know, we've had so, uh, there's been a couple requests for that. Um, it's not anywhere near our forefronts, but it, again, it's very kind. People still have good thoughts mm-hmm. about that, and that is again where a lot of these creative talents got together. And things will come out of that that are just mind blowing to me. Like Action Lab sort of came out of uh, totally, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, great spot well, for networking and just for general comic booky conviviality. Yes, conviviality. Well, I love that word. My fiance and I bought uh, a new house. We've got a pretty good sized backyard. We can hold it there. You guys just <laughs> let me know. Come on out. Um, I hope you don't mind sharing space with the dog, but you can stay with me. It's fine. Are you still out in Illinois somewhere? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm halfway between Chicago and St. Louis. It's pretty much the rest stop if you're driving from <laughs> Chicago to St. Louis. We're the place where you will probably have lunch and fill up the tank and maybe use the restroom. Well, that, it, that's actually that, that's uh, that's part of the tourist brochure. I was going to say, is it in all the billboards? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in marketing, baby. Yes. <laughs> All right, Steve. Well, once again, it's on page 243 of your current previews, Action Lab, Athena Voltaire, uh, and the Golden Dawn, Vaughn, issue number five, and Ghoul Scouts, I Was a Teenage Werewolf tween. Trade. I'm sorry, Tween Age. I got to get a new glasses. we're so funny. Tween wait, Age. Wait, wait till you see uh, volume three of Ghoul Scouts. It's going to be UFOMG. <laughs> <laughs> Mark came up with that one. Nice. Okay, I'll let you finish talking, and I'll stop interrupting. All right. Well, Steve, I just want to say thanks again, and uh, uh, stay in touch, and good luck with uh, the book, and uh, good to have a Chris for us out in San Diego. Mm. Will do. You guys have a great night. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Steve. Bye, guys. Page 264. Did you guys see the all-new underdog and pals, number one? Uh, yes, and uh, also the ant and the aardvark from the uh, uh, Mirish to Patty <laughs> Studios. I remember watching Underdog when I was a little kid. Ugh. Now, I'm looking on page 271. Archie meets Batman 66. What matters here that it's written by Jeff Parker. Amen. Which, Amen. Look at that Mike Allred cover. I'm sure this is going to be immensely fun. Uh, well, I think the next thing I've got is on page 290. Um, where I, getting... I knew it! I was already there waiting for you. <laughs> Go ahead. It's, it's come, something of an event. It's the first Futurama comic we've seen published in a couple of years. It's a Futurama annual number one. Uh, and there's uh, two all-new stories in a 48-page comic, um, and including a, a Futurama fairy tale spoof of Pinocchio called Bendokio, starring Bender. <laughs> Bender is great. My kids have been watching that on and off for the past few years on Netflix. I never really watched Futurama when it was on. The show is tremendous. I, I mm-hmm. so thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, the, 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 the political satire, the pop culture satire. The, it's so well done. Mm-hmm. And it, it, you can't beat you know the, the Nixon head and, and all that 
great stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know there, there's some actual honest to goodness quality science fiction crammed in there amongst all the goofiness. Oh yeah, I want to put on page three hundred two. Capstone Press doing a wonderful series of kid friendly Wonder Woman books. Um, again, I'm always thrilled to see this kind of stuff. When, you know, when, I, when my store was running, I always took pains to stock this kind of this kind of material. It's always a thrill to see kids and their parents come in and go to the right to the kids rack. We need more readers in America, please. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, on page 304, under the Canadian uh, Chapter House Publishing Company, they're going to be doing something called Invasion, which is a uh, line-wide crossover of their series, Captain Canuck, uh, The Pitiful Human Lizard, which is kind of a Spider-Man takeoff that I've enjoyed reading in the past, The North Guard, and a few other <laughs> characters of theirs. Characters of theirs. Uh, so they're doing an issue number zero character files book. And uh, that's available for $1.99 or less, I'm sure, through dcbservice.com. And I'm kind of tempted to give that a try just to expose myself to all the different characters that uh, Chapter House has been doing over the past few years all in one shot. And it's available with two different variant covers, one featuring uh, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada and the other featuring President Trump of the United States, speaking of the, the world needing more readers. <laughs> A little editorialized from word there. I love it. Why not? Um, I want to point on page 315. Uh, EC Comics, the EC Pictofiction Library complete set. Seldom seen, highly sought after for generations. Shock Illustrated, Terror Illustrated, Crime Illustrated, and, and Confessions Illustrated are among the hardest to find EC titles. Not only each of the publishers collected in this deluxe hardcover set, but I saw 18 previously unpublished Pictofiction stories. I love when, when they really go to the depths of the EC history. It's such an important moment at Arid in, in America, the American comic book. Tremendous. Page 316 from Fantagraphics. I, Rene Tardy, Prisoner of War and Stalag 11B. Stalag 11B is Jacques Tardy's homage to his father, a testament to the son's suffering of a generation of men. Uh, again, I love whenever comics explore uh, history like this. So it's based on his research and his father's notes. I, I'm, I'm guessing his father was a prisoner of war. Uh, art looks tremendous. Look at those uh, Stuka dive bombers there. Well done. What else, Murd? One thing that does kind of have me excited, uh, even though I'm not planning to buy it at this time, uh, on page 308 uh, under Disney Press. Um, original comics uh, based on the Disney Channel original animated series Gravity Falls. Now, this was uh, on TV for two seasons. It was created by Alex Hirsch, uh, who also voiced one of the main characters and who is writing the uh, Lost Legends Gravity Falls hardcover that's on page 308. And Gravity Falls is the adventures of two young twins. They're maybe 13 years old uh, or maybe a little younger than that, who go up to the uh, the woods of Oregon, to the town of Gravity Falls, Oregon, to live with their crusty old, uh, uh, old-timey con man, uh, great uncle, in his tourist trap, the Mystery Shack. And they oh. get into all kinds of uh, strange and frequently silly supernatural phenomena that uh, surround this uh, mysterious little uh, forest town. And uh, I like to call it Tween Peaks because it goes for that feel, but it's for a much, a much younger audience. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it's good fun. I really like that, that series. And I've been wanting some original comics based on it for some time, and now we've got th four original stories, all written by uh, series creator and star Alex Hirsch, art by various... Um, and if only it were in a soft cover edition and not for $25, I'd be buying it right now. But I do recommend it to anybody else whose uh, purse strings are a little looser who happen to enjoy that show. I'm sure it'll be, come out in soft cover eventually. Um, it's great to hear that the actual creator is involved in, in, the, in the production. That's wonderful. Guarantee of quality. What do we know about the Lion Forge publisher? They have a, it's quite a quite a spread here in the previews, starting on page uh, three three thirty nine. Are any guys familiar with this publisher? I, I'm not. I don't have any background information on them myself, Chris. But they have uh, put out a few things with that, that I've tried. Uh, uh, on page three fifty, the latest issue of Joe Casey's Excel, for example, which is his you know, out of the box uh, take on the idea of super speed. And how is that? Uh, not not bad. Not bad. Uh, I haven't followed it past the first vol – it's, it's on volume three now. I guess they're, uh, Lion Forge is choosing to do their series as a series of miniseries basically, volumes or seasons as opposed to just ongoing numbering. And right. uh, in, under uh, All Ages on page 354, I've been reading uh, Art and Franco and Chris Russo's series Encounter. 
and how is that? I'm, Art and Franco I'm, are great. So. Oh, it's colorful, kinetic fun, and I must say, I, I actually prefer Chris Giarusso's. Uh, he used to do those like mini Marvel. Oh, uh, I, I love Giarusso's work. Mm. Oh, it's good to see him. It's good to see his name again. Wonderful. Mm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we actually have some original sketches from him from a, a, a con he appeared at. That I, one of the cons I ran years ago. Mm. Nice, very nice mm. guy. I'm going to jump ahead, and we can always jump back if you want, because I have to go to tomorrow's. Because this month, I mean, I'll, I'll be, I'll be frank; it's orgasmic. I mean, what they have coming out here for tomorrow's this month? Damn! Look on page four hundred four. Oh, first of all, Kirby and Lee stuff said soft cover. This is the seventh, seventh issue of the Jack Kirby Collector. This is an historical analysis and breakdown of the Lee Kirby relationship. Why it succeeded, where it deteriorated, and when it eventually failed. Recollections from Ditko, Wood, Ramita Sr., and other bullpen stalwarts. Oh, I cannot wait to read this. You know, I'm fascinated by that history. We talked about it at some length in our Jack Kirby spotlights last summer. Um, and then below that, yes, it's been a while. A new American comic book chronicles the 1990s. The decade when comics nearly imploded for good. Um, <laughs> such an important era in the history of the American comic book. And if, if, if listeners aren't familiar, so Tomorrow's does these beautiful white hardcover history books that chronicle an era in the American comic book. But they also put in the context of the history and pop culture of the time period. These are masterful uh, analyses of the various eras of the American comic book. I can't recommend them enough. I don't care how much this is. It's 44 bucks. doesn't matter. I'm getting it immediately. Next page, back issue 107, looks an Archie in the Bronze Age. And also, I'm very excited about this, talks about Marvel's brief foray in the Bronze Age into – oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm confusing those two. So back issue 107 is about Archie primarily, Red Circle, great. And then Alter Ego 154 talks about, among other things, the Marvel 70s heroines like The Cat and Shannon the She-Devil, Night Nurse. Can't wait to read those uh, histories. Uh, also goes into uh, – Alan Bellman, artist from the early 1940s, Timely Era. Such, oh, these magazines are vital. All right. I'll, I'll calm down now. What else do you want to talk about from the back of the book, Murd? Oh, get ready to get worked up again, Chris. Because go to page 408. It's time for the uh, Jamie D. Memorial Valiant plug. And it's a new book. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Hail Britannia. Yes, Peter Milligan's tale of... Uh, of the uh, Antonius Axia, the, the the first detective of modern European history, who's a citizen of the Roman Empire in this miniseries, Lost Eagles of Rome. He's going out to rescue uh, the uh, captured eagles of uh, a few uh, Roman f uh, phalanxes. Uh, they've been taken by uh, tribesmen dwelling in the German forest of the dead, the Totenwald. Well, Murder and I have both praised the first two volumes of this concept uh, profusely. Uh, first of all, the attention to historical detail. Each issue has an essay at the, at the back which where they, they bring in a story into, to – and they're always very well written. They're, they're not dry where they talk about you – know, give you context in terms of what you were seeing in the comic. And uh, I, I'm sure Murray will echo my sentiment here. That these are beautifully done you know, mystery stories but in the context of ancient Rome, of imperial Rome during the time of Nero. And uh, you know – and exploring this detective, his relationship to the Vestal Virgins, that order, um, and how he's empowered by them, and, and you know how he's using his detecting skills, and how he tries to navigate you know the deadly political intrigue of, of the Nero era. These are masterful. I'm so thrilled they're coming out with a, with a new uh, volume, and I have to assume that these books are doing well because they're, they're doing another one. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that people are reading them. As am I, and I will certainly yeah. be reading this one as well as I know you will too, Chris. Oh, yes. And this is what to talk about from the back of the book. Um, I think that does it for me. And I know I don't have anything marked in the uh, manga section or the merchandise sections either. Yeah, I think I am good as well, gentlemen. Pantaloons, any uh, closing thoughts you mm, want to give here? Nope. That'll just wrap it up for us. 
All right, so once again, this episode is brought to you by Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com for all your pre-ordering needs. If you'd like to send us an email, our address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail, you can call 267-702-6642. You can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle there is at comicgeekspeak. You can go to our new forum address at thecomicforums.vanillacommunity.com. Yes, we just recently got a new URL. Don't ask me how. It just happened recently. Um, But uh, that is the site of our forums where you can go to talk back, give us feedback about this episode and many other episodes of our podcast. You know, tell us what you're ordering from previews this month or just shoot the breeze. While there, you can also engage in several other uh, comic book related discussions or discussions on any topics uh, even distantly related uh, with your fellow CGS listeners and fans. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you out there who've donated monetarily to our podcast, either recently or in the distant past. We really appreciate it. The show would not be what it is today without your help. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time.